You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Benazzi from OptionPit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That rocking tune means it's time to rock out. With the old option block, All-Stars, my name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the aforementioned network of this here fine show, The Option Block. And you can find it pretty much anywhere you like. You can get it on all the big platforms. You can get it on our mobile app, get it on the website. You can even get it live if you are so inclined every Monday and Thursday. So clear your schedule. Monday and Thursday, 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. Grab that Mixler link. And you, too, can join in the live parte that is the option block. Never know what the heck we're going to talk about. Could be Bitcoin, could be VIX, could be a whole bunch of UA, could be some other weird stuff, lighten it up. A whole bunch of your questions. That's another good thing. If you're in the live thing, you get to jump to the front of the queue when it comes to questions. So if you got those percolating in your brain, then that may be a fun way for you to go. And, of course, however you listen, if you can't make it live, that's okay. We allow it. But to make sure, if you do have questions, hit us up there or via social media or via the website or email. Because we do, on occasion, like to hear from you guys. And joining me on the old program today, let's go. You know, it's funny. We just beamed out to New Hampshire about an hour ago. Let's go now just a wee bit farther north to uh, what we call the area of the U.S., uh, colloquially known as Canada adjacent where we are, where we are joined by the Rock Lobster himself, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi from Option Pit. Mr. G, welcome back to the show. How does it feel to be Canada's smallest neighbor to the east there? Canada. Yep. Oh, yep. Like I tell Canada. you, just the hits, the, hits keep, the hits keep coming. My gosh. So I'm insulting not just I Mainers. I don't, I don't even know why I do this show. Not just Mainers, it's, it's, but Canadians. I, I, equal insults to all there. Canada, I like that. I, I um, Canada. <laughs> All I know is um, life. Life is chilly today in in uh, in Canada, but but not too bad. But what were you doing in New Hampshire anyway? New uh, Hampshire. We were beaming into uh, the Orats folks, talking all things advisors and options. About ah, yeah, about an hour still, ago. So yes, he's still so. there. I'm surprised he's not in you know Brazil or somewhere else by now because he kind of he sort of travels the globe, but. Um, I, one of these days, I have to visit him. Maybe he'll come and skate on my ice rink suit, and you can get a secondhand knowledge of the uh, the existence. Oh yeah, how goes? I haven't gotten an updated photo in a while. How goes the uh, last year? Was a bit of a mud puddle. Is it? Has it turned out better this, this year? Uh, it's definitely better this year. I still we could use a little, Mother Nature has to help us and give me a little bit more water because it's basically the size of a swimming big swimming pool. So it is. It is it is frozen. We just could use a little more water. We got weird weather pattern this weekend. So after this, I'm just going to finish flooding it and see what we get. And then not joining us from Canada, but from uh, parts out west, we are joined, I believe, by the mostly sane and sentient once again, Uncle Mike Dusa. He made the mistake, listeners, of beaming into us uh, last week when I was struck down with the plague. And, you know, this plague is so nasty that it can even cross uh, cross the broadcast waves and it went and struck him down last this I should say this week as well. Thankfully, he seems to be in recovery mode for the most part. Uncle Mike, there are you sane and are you lucid and how, how go things, Uncle Mike? 
<laughs> well, I I don't know. I, I might be recovered, but I doubt my sanity's ever going to be in existence ever. I don't know if I've ever been sane uh, it, from the first place. Uh, like the old adage of all the things I've ever lost, I missed my mind the most. Yes, I, I could uh, I could probably uh, commensurate with you, or commensurate, I should say commensurate. I'm all full of fun words uh, today, but let's get rolling with uh, all things Canadia in, because it's time for the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. All right, everybody, welcome to the trading block, the portion of the show where we break down what was trading, a bit of a quiet one uh, today, most of the major indices uh, kind of closing split on the day. The Nasdaq closing off almost, lit actually closing almost literally unched off uh, point. To actually, just, it's showing 0, 0.00 on my screen right now. So it is flick. Oh, just ticked up 0 0.01. So flickering around the unched level, gripping, gripping entertainment there to watch there, listeners. Uh, the S and P and the Dow ending up the day up slightly. Uh, VIX Cash taking a little bit of a relaxer off about. Uh, about a tenth of a handle or so, but still in the mid nine range and about 963 or so uh, wrapping up the day here. So uh, interesting kind of a, you know, it's, we're coming into uh, next week, of course, will be a truncated holiday week. So we're coming into that in a wee bit and maybe some people already, uh, already heading to greener pastures. Perhaps they're taking a trip to Canada, even though they're past leaf peeping season. Now they have to really go for the, uh, the skiing and snowshoeing season. It sounds like up there. So, Mr. Rock Lobster, if I were to hedge your way, and I was not interested in skiing and snowshoeing. Instead, I was interested in all things VIX and, and markets. What would I see, sir? You would see, um, from the, the vantage point of uh, Canada, <laughs> um, I think we're doing a little bit of wait, a little bit of worry about government uh, shutdown. Um, but we had a day where... You know, the SPX was up a little bit. I mean, how much more good news can the market absorb? It's already, you know, uh, I think we're at another all-time high today, or we're darn close to it. So uh, VIX was very – it's the holiday. It's We're going to basically have a week off. It's hard for VIX to go lower than it is at this point. Um, although we did have what I believe you guys will probably talk on your show tomorrow. I believe we had a historic settle for VIX yesterday. 875. Um, so that was a surprise. VIX actually settled in the eight hand, <laughs> which uh, uh, you have to give the uh, you have to give the greasy meatball some props for uh, uh, for managing our positions well too during that. So, but anyway, that's for the fun anyway. So, uh, but we have uh, actually what things are is it's very normal. Very normal vol conditions, I would say, for VIX that's 968 at the bottom of the scale. Um, there is just – there is not a lot out here, uh, a lot. For whatever reason, um, you know, the investors love the market. Stocks are going up. That means vol is low. And um, the only thing I would say, there's a little bit of a, a disconnect between um, – and it's funny to hear this, but – Volatility in oils, commodities, minerals, stuff like that, super low. Um, volatility in tech, technology, even, you know, the Intels, the Microsoft of the world, a little higher than normal as far as option vol. So uh, the market seems to be kind of uh, betting on or they're just more active buyers of juice in uh, big technology. And as far as... You know, we used to remember just a couple of years ago when oil with prices were crashing and everybody was worried. Oil vol is about as low as it's been in, I, I think, for at least the last five or six years. So um, you have a strange disconnect in all that. So you've got higher tech vol, lower kind of commodity oil mineral vol, and you have a VIX at 967 and sort of uh, there's a little – the futures are a little juicy but no more juicy than normal. Uh, considering VIX is where it is, so there's not there's not a great expectation for vol going higher. Let's put it that way, at least for right now. No, we we're just talking about that on our advisor show with uh, your buddy from Orats there, and about what we're seeing out there in the 
and the options and how it doesn't it doesn't seem to be pricing in a uh, massive return to a 40 VIX anytime soon in 2018. But we shall save all of that conversation for volatility views tomorrow. Instead, Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, as you're enjoying your uh, your warm tea and crackers, what was catching your eye there, sir, on the old uh, markets? Slippery stuff, oil. Uh, actually, I shouldn't say oil, but I would just say the energy stocks uh, of all the sectors of the uh, as, that are out there today. Uh, energy is the big mover, which uh, it's uh, rather ironic in that uh, we didn't have a, a large move in oil or natural gas today, but uh, we did have uh, over a two percent move in XLE. Uh, that's definitely the main mover of this marketplace. Everything else was either flat. Uh, financials had a decent size move today, so I shouldn't say that. Financials uh, were up uh, roughly 0.8 percent on the day. Uh, and then we had consumer discretionaries up a little bit as well. But uh, uh, really, the main thing that I'm seeing on my screen is the um, the slippery stuff, black gold, Texas tea. Uh, of course, a lot of the oil stocks are up. Uh, Chevron's up. Uh, so that's the main thing that I'm seeing on my screen that's really moving the market at this point in time. Uh, overall, just some other things just of note. Um, Apple is up a couple pennies on the day, up uh, 66 cents. Uh, gold and silver are roughly flat on the day. Uh, silver's down three pennies. Gold's up 17 cents. So really nothing uh, too crazy along those lines. Uh, but overall, uh, the main thing that I am seeing that's really lighting up my tape is the energy. Yes, energy. I think you spent too much time on Twifo last week, sir. You got uh, you got energy on the brain. Again, we'll be talking about that probably more uh, tomorrow over there. On this week in futures options. You know, it is nice. It feels like a bit of a throwback. You know, the season, the cycle seems like it's mostly done. But there are still some names popping off from an earnings perspective. And we got a, a fairly big one after the bell today. Good old Nike. Uh, so, yeah, there are still some names on the old docket. Nike, of course, ticker symbol NKE closing today. Where did it close? About 64 77 or so. Up about a little over a buck, so nearly 2% on the day. So they had a decent intraday move. Maybe some of that going to be reflecting some of the earnings uh, excitement. They're pricing in close to 3 and a half bucks, so right around 5%. And here in the after hours, they still seem to be uh, digesting the number because uh, it's pretty much off about a dime or so in the after hours. So I don't think they've really uh, really made up their mind on what that is. Either that or this is going to be one of the more successful premium sales in quite some time. But I don't think that is going to be the case. But what is, we'll, we'll keep an eye on this throughout the show, though. We'll let you know if there's anything else uh, percolating under the wrapper. You know, what is the case, though? And we were kind of just talking about this on the advisor's option. Worth kind of bringing it up here as well you know we are coming towards the end of 2017 so it is a natural to start looking in the old rear view mirror at the year that was and you think of 2017 you pretty much think of the year that wasn't from a volatility perspective you know we said many times only half jokingly that if anyone came on the network in the beginning of, of january and was talking about what we ended up seeing which was just a complete dearth of volatility we would have laughed them off to, off the air it would have sounded ridiculous and if they also had followed it up with but it would still be a banner year for things like vix options and vix futures and everything else and, and the options market wouldn't do too terribly uh, even with that anemic volatility we would have laughed them off twice as hard and yet that's pretty much uh, exactly what we saw it's just just been a crazy year 61 or so new record highs in the S&P since January. That might even be dated at this point. That's a couple of weeks old, I believe. Uh, up more than 20% for the year. That number, by the way, is new highs. Third most since 1952. And also, uh, uh, the FT did an interesting analysis a, a few weeks ago of, uh, you know, you break down market volatility a lot of different ways. Obviously, the VIX is one. There's realized volatility. Uh, there's just, you can just talk about how much net, net movement you see out there in the S&P. A pretty simple, basic way to go. And that's exactly what FT did. They looked at the S&P and went all the way back to 1927, analyzing pretty much just how much the S&P moved any given day. Uh, the, and since election day this year, or actually since election day last year, obviously, so pretty much this last calendar year, uh, it's been the S&P has averaged 0.31% moving every day. So that's the lowest they saw in their data in more over 50 years. In fact, you got to go all the way back 
to the year immediately following the assassination of JFK. That's how far back you have to go. And you wouldn't think off the top of your head that would be a very quiet year. you think that would be very tumultuous. Yep. Uh, the 12 months after the assassination of JFK, that's where we saw an average daily movement of only 0.25%. It's the last time we saw anything even approaching uh, these levels. And pretty much over the last half of a century, uh, we've seen a moving an average of 0.72% a day. So pretty much more than double what we saw this year. So just crazy stuff across the board. Also, when you're talking, you know, you're talking returns, the up index up over 20% this year, and also low volatility. Bit of a perfect storm when it comes to things like the sharp ratio. So this year's sharp ratio uh, is uh, is in the 0.3 percentile, 0.3 percentile. So effectively, it beats 99.7 percent of all times in market history since, at least in this data, this goes back actually, I think, to 1900. So uh, just just astronomical what an outlier this year has uh, been. Uh, you know, we're looking at charts here. We can include some of these in the show notes of how many days in the year the VIX is under 12. And we got over 100, actually pushing 200 this year. The days in the VIX under 10, uh, over 45 this year. You got to go, you can't find anything close to that. Uh, you get, closest is five back in 1995. And days under 12, the closest we get is back in 2007 with around 140 odd that year. So just crazy stuff, pretty much however you cut it. Mr. Rock Lobster, uh, what are your thoughts here on just, just 2017 and what a wild, in, in many ways, in other ways, not quite wild at all, year it has been. The single-digit president? <laughs> yeah, imagine if you had said that to me a year ago. That might have been, I might have finally said, that's it, we're done with the Rock Lobster. He's just lost his mind. Uh, and yet, here, a year later, you would have seen, like, the wisest man in the room. <laughs> so, um, historically, it's hard to imagine that this can continue. So, <laughs> I guess... Um, and, and we know how expensive buying long-term vol is. It's, it's impossible. So, uh, it's not impossible. It's just, it's just really expensive. Um, but it, uh, this is probably as low as vol is going to get. So, uh, just like with clients today, we're looking at longer term vol to buy, um, which I think makes the most sense. Cause even if we have, uh, more rally, uh, that still can pay. So I, it's weird because it's, it seems like all the volatility surrounds the president, but in the market, it just does not seem to stay around <laughs> for very long. So, you know, like you've seen how many market cycles, uh, you trade the market cycle you have and that currently, uh, own gamma and fade the volatility and, and just watch things play until we actually have something happen again. Mr. Uncle Mike, same uh, same question for you, sir. What are you, what are your thoughts on this? Just you know, pretty much almost by any measure you look at, it's been just a crazy outlier historic year. What are your thoughts here on on 2017, the year that wasn't at least when it came to to anything volatility related? No, I would agree totally. If you'd have told me, uh, I still remember it clear as day after on the night of the election with the hundred point move in S and P futures and the thousand point move in the Dow futures and just the client emails I'm getting on my phone watching the election returns. And uh, just magically everything just goes uh, pretty much to the upside. I would not have expected all of this. Uh, the other thing that I, I don't even know how many times I was telling clients, I'm, I'm saying that I, I really don't think this vol is going to be at this level forever. Uh, so this was definitely a major surprise and uh, just the, the thought, I don't know how many times we even said on this show as well, Donald Trump is not a, not a single-digit VIX president. Uh, and, uh, well, he's, for the most part, a vast majority of his time in office so far, the VIX has been in single digits. So uh, that's definitely been a surprise, to say the least. Now, of course, the good news is, for those of us market bulls, such as myself, uh, this has been a phenomenal year. Uh, from the standpoint of that of a rate of return. Uh, financials have done very well, and uh, this is not something that uh, I think any of us would have expected from a volatility standpoint. Uh, the thing that I was really excited about with financials uh, was that uh, we were able to it, it wasn't necessarily, and I, I remember even saying this earlier in the year, it wasn't necessarily a rally based on what's going to 
happen immediately, uh, at least in the XLF space. Uh, it was a rally based upon what people, the, it was uh, very much a perception rally, and that Donald Trump is the business president, things are going to be better for financials. And so uh, XLF had a really big year this year. So a uh, lot happened, uh, definitely not a very common year, and that uh, we're constantly at a nine VIX, but uh, exciting to say the least. Trump ain't a single-digit VIX president. I think never have more false, less true words ever been uttered on these airwaves, at least so far. So uh, we'll keep an eye on that as we keep an eye on a lot of other things as we keep on rolling right on into the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. everybody everyone who wants the funky the weird the wild options action lighten it up today you came to the right place you came to the odd block let's kick things off as we like to do you know it seems mr rock lobster here it's kind of interesting we've been talking a lot about these tesla catastrophe puts it seems like the narrative though may be shifting a little bit uh, or at least uh, equating uh, to also to those we talk all the time of course about the jan 2019 50 puts uh, but the Jan 2020 puts getting more love these days as well. So perhaps someone uh, discovering those now, deciding, you know, I don't. I, why should I pay a whole 60 cents to go out to Jan 2019 when I could instead spend another two dollars to go all the way out to Jan 2020? <laughs> uh, yes, there you go. Just just a bargain by by any stretch of the imagination. And these puts were lighting it up again today. 83 of the Jan 2019. 50 puts going on the tape. We're pushing, starting to push now, listeners. 36,000 OI. Not quite there yet, but pretty darn close. And also 80 of the Jan 2020 50 puts. Maybe a bit of a uh, calendar going up there. Who knows? Uh, maybe someone is starting to spread off against the massive amount of OI that is sitting on that uh, 2019 50 strike. Either way, both of them doing about 80 contracts today. So coincidence? I leave that to you guys to determine, listeners. Over 4,000 now open on these Jan 2020 50 puts. These things trading a whopping two and a half bucks, Mr. Rock Lobster. You can tell us, you can admit to us if you want that uh, that's you spreading between these two, right? <laughs> it's just, I'm looking at it and, you know, you look at those puts and they're going to sit there forever and ever and ever and not move a whole lot, um, probably for a year, I guess, just because the decay is so low on them. Um, I, it, it's just, I guess it also, you look at, and also what's funny is you notice how it's the, the even handle strike, like the 50 strike, the hundred strike, you know, that 75 strike, not good enough. I need the hundred strike or I need the 50 strike. It's kind of strange market psychology, I guess. Um, but I, it's hard. It's hard. Like I said, it's hard to bet against that guy. He's, he, he, he can, he can shuck and jive and move and dance uh, as well as anybody. So for right now, uh, Tesla is a $330 stock and has a $100 billion market cap, I think. And no, it's $55 billion market cap. So he seems to keep being able to do it. So I, it's, it's, it boggles my mind. I found it. It's, I think it's also from an option point of view, it's a difficult product to trade. Um, because the vol's kind of high for a three hundred and thirty dollars stock, so just you know, it's sort of one of those things where you'd like to sell options, but it's Tesla, and so it just it's just a, it's, it's a difficult one. I've mostly just stare at it now and not try to get very involved. Yeah, the, I mean the vol is crazy. They're pricing in an extra two bucks for an extra year's worth of carry on the fifty strike. That's just that's just. That's rich. <laughs> no, however, it's however, not nothing. however you cut that there. So yeah, they're pricing in some uh, some shall we say technical term funky levels here on these fifty puts. Uh, you were joking about how rich the uh, the twenty nineteen fifty puts are, but an extra two bucks buys you a whole extra year out here on on the fifty handle because you know it costs a lot to carry that strike all the way, Mister Rock Lobster. I don't know if you're you're familiar with that, but uh, that fifty that fifty bucks carrying that a year that's going to cost you. 
It's going to cost you some cash. All right. Uh, we'll keep an eye on these. Write in. Let us know what you think. People are spreading these off or what you think is going on with these uh, these crazy, odd, weird, just nutso puts. Meanwhile, let's keep on rolling. And we haven't, I don't, we haven't talked about this one in uh, the odd block in certainly quite some time. Uh, this is Autodesk, ticker symbol ADSK, closing today at 104.43, off about 60 cents or a little more, about six cents of a percent or so. This is the name that does about 7,000 contracts a day. Today, doing 39, nearly 40,000 contracts today. So a little bit more than average, about 14 to 1 calls over puts and that's where our eye of Sauron was drawn looks like a bit of a uh, a bit of a funky uh, verdict it's not really I mean it, I'm looking here it could be a roll but it'd be weird also because then it'd be rolling back I can count on one hand the number of roll backs we've seen on uh, in the old odd block but that could indeed be the case let's parse it here a little bit we saw the March 110 April 115 uh, diagonal slash roll slash call it what you will uh, going up uh, starting the day about 14,000 times and change paper it looks like they're they were picking up the 110 calls in March for 435 and it looks like they were perhaps dumping the uh, April 115 calls for three and a half bucks or doing the whole thing for 85 cents as the day went on they did a total of about 16,000 and change on the March and about 15 and a half thousand on the April. Worth noting, the reason why I say it might be a weird rollback is there's size open interest on the Aprils to the tune of about 16,000 and change and really nothing open on the Marches. So clearly it looks like potentially uh, there could be some closing and rolling back. And again, looking at where the strikes are and where the stock is trading right now, you know, it's south of 105. So perhaps they're looking to get a little bit meatier, a little bit more relevant strike on for their, uh, they're not getting a lot of juice. The 115 is trading, like I said, $3.50 right around there. They want a little bit more juice, perhaps a little bit more bang for their buck. Let's look at what's been up here in Autodesk over the past year. It's been an interesting one. It's kind of been a long, slow upside burn here with a few gaps, most noticeably back in May when it gapped from about 90 Oh, about 93 bucks up to about 114 in the span of a couple of sessions around earnings. So that was a nice little pop there. Started the year, oh, about 75 bucks, and it hit its high very recently, right around 130 before getting its wings clipped during earnings back in November and now kind of flirting around the 104 level. So uh, interesting stuff here, Mr. Rock Lobster. It could be parsed a number of different ways. Either way, it's pretty weird. Uh, if you are indeed overwriting on the 115 strike, and then you decide against your strike. Uh, usually you might see these guys roll down in the same month or perhaps even roll out, give themselves a little bit more time. Of course, that costs more money. Uh, instead, if this is indeed a roll, he's rolling backwards, which is odd. Or it could be someone deciding he likes that 115 strike. He wants to pile on a little more with a funky diagonal, which is also weird. Mr. Rock Lobster, when you see this invite to this weird funky diagonal roll party, what was what was your thought? Are you gonna are you gonna go to this thing? You gonna say oh, I want to check this thing out, or is this one a little bit too weird, too off putting for your tastes? Um, you, we we have this conversation many times, and we both agree on the same thing. Why do you take something that you own that you want to have a position in April and roll it back um, for negligible dollars for that for that position? You're Let's say you had the 110 trade on. Maybe you put it on. You sold them higher. They close them, and now they're selling the April. Uh, you're moving into the March 110. Or you're, I'm sorry for the April 115s, and now you're moving into the March 110s. I, I, the only thing I can think of is they want to get closer to the money and kind of jack it up a little bit. Um, it's not a. That's what it feels like, and. Um, I, I guess, you know, it's one thing I can think of. Maybe they're nervous. I guess if you have 15,000 calls on on a strike, you get nervous after a while and you, um, and you want to do something. But the only thing I could think of is they went from less volume or they, they went from, which is strange, they go, if they had the April on, they go from more volume to less volume. So they're trying to kind of do it dollar neutral, but I don't think it's exactly dollar neutral the way I'm looking at it. Um, it, it's, it, but it still feels like, um, they want to, they're closing a short, but then 
selling the March 110s more aggressively. It's just a, I don't know. It's like you're rolling, you're rolling close. I'm sorry, you're rolling in and down. So you're trying to be more aggressive on the premium, but the premium is about the same. So I don't know what they're gaining by getting more aggressive going to March. I don't, that's, again, this is, this is, we, sometimes I think we should just call this the confusing block because you're moving closer, but closer to the money for the same premium. Why do it? And that's my, unless it's around earnings or they screwed up on the April and um, maybe they want to sell c contracts before the earnings cycle, that could be the only thing I really can think about. So Usually it's that usually has something to do with it. So uh, no, both both earnings are going to uh, the March or April are going to catch the same cycle. So you got me on this one. This is a total ball of confusion. Why they would <laughs> that's the fun thing. Over. Fun thing about the odd block. Either way, you kind of parse this one. It doesn't really make a heck of a lot of sense. That's those are always the fun ones. No matter how you look at 15, it, fifteen thousand times. Yes, fifteen thousand <laughs> times just to do it. Uh, he really liked the apes. Now he decides to lose time and uh, get a little bit closer to the fire. So maybe some some bang for his buck there. But you're right. The premium is is not exactly that big of a of a despair. He did the whole thing for 85 cents. So, yeah, the whole thing is um, is a bit of a head scratcher. But that's why we like to call it the option, the option block. That's the show. The odd block would be the segment uh, because we get some weird ones. We're going to put that one in the funky to be watched category so we can bring it back and hopefully uh, puzzle the Rock Lobster, even more in the future, maybe around March when we see what's going on with those things. Of course, if this guy's rolling them now, then who knows when he actually might roll those again. Uh, maybe he'll roll to Jan next week, Mr. Rock Lobster, and then we'll have a lot more to parse. Meanwhile, let's move on to the FTC. No, not the FTC you're thinking of. This is first Data Corp, uh, ticker symbol. Like I said, FTC, closing today. <coughs> Excuse me. Uncle Mike's plague still coming through the wires at me. Almost 16 and a half bucks, 16.42 to be precise, up about a quarter of a buck or about 1.6%. This is the name that does about, oh, about 1,700 contracts a day. Today, doing about 45,000. Of that 45,000, approximately 38,000 coming in this one. I know you like yourself a good call party, Mr. Rock Lobster. That seems to be pretty much exactly what we got going on here uh, in good old FTC. Somebody, or everybody, I should say, Getting their got to get their hands on these Jan 17s in uh, FTC. This is just where all the action was today. Uh, it was lighting it up. Uh, interestingly enough, it was a lot of small blocks of this, and also in some funky sizes, funk, funk, funky prices, I should say. Blocks ranging most of them from about 500 to about 1500 contracts. But obviously, when you're doing nearly 40,000, that's a lot of blocks. And prices ranging from 20 cents, those look really good right now, up to about 45 cents. These things went out 35 at 40. So that 20 cent kind, I think you got like 1500 at least at that price. So you got a decent amount there. Uh, but uh, either way, funky for the size, funky for the weird execution, funky for the pricing as well. You don't usually see this much of a disparity on pricing on these kind of things. Usually it's the bulk of them go up 20, 25 cents all around that range, something like that. Not in such a big, such a big chasm of pricing. All opening as well, only 900 contracts and change open there. So uh, let's pull it up and see what's been happening in our friend FTC over the past year. This thing kicked off the year, oh, right around uh, about 14 and a half bucks or so, and then proceeded to kind of rally for most of, uh, most of the year here as I am suddenly logged out of my system for no apparent reason. So let's just reboot that there really quickly here. And yeah, it has been an interesting year out here in FTC. There it is. All right. <laughs> With, like I said, starting about 14 and a half bucks and then rallying all the way up to about 19 bucks in July. Hit that level again back just a few months ago in October and then kind of slowly came off to where we are now right around 16 and a half bucks. So there is perhaps some prior art Mr. Rock Lobster, for this thing blowing through the 17 strike, certainly looks like someone wants that to happen and wants that to happen for a boatload of size here. So when you get this invite in the mail, Mr. Rock Lobster, because you are quite the social butterfly, even all the way up there in Maine, you get invited to all the cool call parties. Will, this, will you be attending this one? So, and if so, what, what do you make of this? Is this a fancy black tie or is this kind of more low rent kind of cowboy boot kind of thing? 
Um, it's I, this is kind of a curious one of somebody coming in and scooping some cheap vol. Um, and FDC didn't hasn't really participated hugely this year in our rally. I mean, it's up a little bit. It was up a lot more earlier um, in the quarter. It it does not look like a crazy play. You know, you're only spending forty or twenty cents. Obviously, was really good. But you only spend like forty cents. With a month ago, the only thing is they're not buying earnings, so they're buying something. So um, maybe, you know, maybe there could be some tax law help for the company here going into the end of the year. I'm, I'm kind of thinking that, but but it's a it's a whole big chunk of uh, I want to have the upside. So I it's not an let's just say it's not an unreasonable purchase, but it's still uh, it's still you know, it's uh, somebody's, well, somebody's dang bullish, um, but they're not getting the earning cycle out of it. So it, it smells a little bit like uh, a takeover talk or somebody knows something. It does have a bit of a whiff about it. If they are, if they do feel they know something, uh, they're not shy about showing it. They're putting on all the size here in good old uh, good old FDC. So we're, we're going to file that one in the to-be-watch category as well. Let's see how this one works. If this person really knows what they think they know or if they're just uh, wasting a lot of money here <laughs> on the 17 strike. And that wasn't enough of a call palooza for you listeners to say, you know, I still got a little bit of a hankering for some uh, near-term upside calls. We got you covered. Not quite as near-term as those. These are going to go out a year or so, but still. I uh, got some upside to them. Let's, let's get to Blackstone Group. These is ticker symbol BX closing today right around 33 bucks, 32.90 to be precise. Up nearly a buck or nearly 3%. Not a bad day here for good old Blackstone. It's a name that does about 13, 14,000 contracts a day. Today doing about 47,000, 15 to 1 calls over puts. And that's where our eye was drawn yet again. Jan Call Palooza. This time Jan 2019, where we saw someone lighten up the 40 calls, listeners. Yes, 4 0. We saw paper coming in, uh, picking up a big clip of those, these over, tw- over 20,000 in one uh, pretty, pretty sizable mega block. Uh, scooping those looks like for about 78 cents. Uh, it is worth noting this is potentially closing, which would also make it weird because these are over a year out because there is some size on the strike, about 28,000. Uh, there's a decent size in Jan across the board here in Blackstone, though, about 20,000 of the 35s, 40,000 of the 30s, and about 13,000 of the 30 puts. So there is some size playing. So it could be someone deciding, you know what, uh, I, I do like these. I, it would be weird if this was indeed, if they're buying these and they're closing out a short call to do it a year or so ahead of time. But we've heard weirder things uh, out here. <laughs> uh, let's see at the year that's been out here in good old Blackstone, as you might imagine. Uh, they were riding some of that uh, early Trump wave but pretty much all the way up. Seemed to have peaked back in October, right around 35 bucks, And ever since then, it kind of been vacillating. They actually dipped down below 30 briefly back, oh, about a month ago. And now they're kind of hovering right around 33, right in the middle of that range. Today's rally puts them nice, uh, in nice green territory again. But they got as low as, oh, about uh, 26 and change uh, right towards the end of last year. So it's been an interesting, ra- ra- interesting year for Blackstone. Uh, perhaps not quite as much of a lift as some people had hoped they were going to get with all this uh, interesting stuff afoot in the marketplace. Take us home, Mr. Rock Lobster. Are you feeling close on these? If so, why would you close your covered call with a year to go, sir? The tax thing. You know, maybe everybody's like, well, you know, there's a lot of upside. Um, it is it is a strange close, I have to say. It most likely probably is, but... It's one of those where all of a sudden somebody's feeling the animal spirits might be coming back into uh, private equity. So um, their their tax treatment was uh, seemed to have uh, did not hit, hit the cutting room floor. So uh, maybe there's a there's a lot of happy going on in um, in uh, private equity land. So uh, the, all of a sudden, maybe writing calls doesn't sound like such a good idea anymore. Yeah, I guess they uh, they decided, you know, uh, we don't need that last year. We, we harvested after all. Let's just uh, take it off the board now and uh, keep the party going. Speaking of the keeping the party going, listeners, we're going to do just that. It's Thursday. I think Uncle Mike has had enough time to recover his voice, so let's dive right on into the strategy block. 
It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for the strategy block. All right, Uncle Mike, I got a feeling you're going to be holding court today on the therapeutic benefits of chicken soup and crackers. Am I correct, sir? I really don't have the appetite for chicken soup, quite honestly. I'm just sticking with crackers at this point, and uh, that kind of has to I kind of have to force down those crackers. So uh, uh, just kind of happy with water, to tell you the truth. I, ch I change it then, the, the therapeutic powers of water, sir. <laughs> got it, got it. Well, it's important to stay liquid. Ha ha, get it? Um, anyway, what I want to go through today, uh, a little bit of an update on some of the trading that I'm doing in the in the leveraged bullish SPY strategy with which we do. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I stopped rolling up all of my December calls just because of the fact that it was just getting too close for comfort for me to uh, be in all of these December calls going into the end of the year, going into expiration. So uh, we did kind of a reboot, uh, if you will, and are out in March right now. So current position with which we have at this point uh, for March, and this is all on SPY, uh, we're long the 275 call for March. Uh, we got into that, uh, like I said, a few weeks ago. Uh, and then we got into that at $1.30, I'm sorry, $1.31 per contract. And for a, a means of financing it, and this we got into, it was December 4th is the day we got into it. As a means of financing it, we sold the 252 248 put spread. Uh, we got 50 cents for it, uh, also for March. Uh, now, granted, I'm not a huge fan of selling longer term put spreads, but this is an example to where I feel you need to kind of play with the cards you're dealt. And we've been dealt a, a very low volatility marketplace right now, my opinion. I suppose in theory the VIX could go lower, but I'll save that debate for, uh, for vol views. Uh, it could go lower, but uh, in general, from my standpoint, the volatility is pretty darn low right now. Uh, so with that being said, I want to benefit from upside and uh, I want to buy cheap calls. Uh, so we, when we did this, SPY was at roughly 264, 265, somewhere along those lines. And uh, the trade's a little bit profitable right now, not nothing huge by any means, because uh, we haven't had that much market movement. But the concept behind this trade is that if we do have a very bullish market between now and March, uh, meaning if SPY goes to 280, 290, somewhere along those lines, then uh, this is going to be a very profitable trade. Uh, if we stay around the same area, well, I think I'm out uh, roughly 80 cents. Uh, and we'll talk about some things that I'm doing in case we stay neutral here in a moment. Uh, and then if we go down, the first point of pain, as I like to put it, uh, is, around, is the 252 level. Now, granted, this is expiration day risk. So that means if I were to do nothing until expiration, 252 would be the pain point uh, in SPY. I would likely, if we start to go down to the lower 260s, is when I would look to maybe do some type of a roll with this or some type of protection with this. And I've talked about adjustments of what I'll do with put spreads on the show many times. Uh, I'm not going to get too into that today, but if we go down there, I'll definitely keep uh, you guys updated uh, on what I'm doing with this. But the reason that I like this is this does provide a little bit of financing for the out-of-the-money call. Now, with that, I'm still buying an out-of-the-money call for a debit. So in the meantime, a way with which I'm looking to finance this is what I've been doing and I've talked on the show for probably the last couple of years now, just doing some weekly put spreads at times. And so in the meantime, to finance that 80 cents, I have a lot of confidence that between now and March, I'll be able to uh, finance it with selling some weekly put spreads. Now, let's say this market goes straight up and I don't get any dips to sell any put spreads. Well, um, I, I really won't complain if all of a sudden SPY is at 285 or 290 in March uh, and I'm just helping clients make money on the 275 call and I had to pay 80 cents for that. Uh, that really doesn't bother me that much. Um, if, if I were to go to a party uh, and say to someone, hey, we made a lot of money, and uh, but you know we had to buy premium on it. We, we had to do it as by buying out of the money calls in a, in a nine VIX market. I guarantee you no one's going to laugh at me for something like that. Well, maybe they would if I were going to a party with uh, Andrew and uh, Mark and those guys. They'd probably make fun of me. But in reality, the point is, is that 
I like to look at the worst case scenarios of things. And this is a strategy right now that I think can make a lot of sense for you if you're a bull like me and you're prepared to manage risk like me. I think that we're at a time in the marketplace to where not only is it is it uh, and a lot of times very feasible to do these leveraged risk reversals like I'm talking about, but I'm doing a lot of risk reversals in general with the non-levered money as well. I think it's a good time for it. Uh, it's just the bottom line of that uh, if you're buying cheap calls, then uh, it's hard to be wrong when the market goes straight up. So that's my strategy for today. And uh, I guess that, no, oh, no, I was about to say it would be the last one of the year, but I think we are going to have the show again next week too. So it's not the last one of the year, uh, but stay tuned. Uh, next week, we will have the last one of the year. Yes, hard, hard to believe we're already in that territory, but we are approaching. Monday, of course, we'll be off, listeners, but we'll be back on Thursday. So you're not done with us quite yet, and we're not done with you because we still got a little bit of time. So let's bring on some of your questions with the mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. All right, everybody. We got a couple of uh, questions that are just uh, consuming you guys <laughs> these days. A lot of interest in these. Uh, so we'll get into what your responses are. First off, we asked you at the beginning of the week, uh, when do you guys think we'll get them their Bitcoin options that you guys keep asking us about? And we gave you four choices, Q1, Q2, Q3, or Q4. And then, <coughs> excuse me, uh, as a follow-up, yesterday, breaking news in case you missed it, listeners. Uh, of course, we saw the SIBO and CME launch their futures in recent weeks on Bitcoin. ICE deciding, you yeah, know, the heck with the futures. Let's make our own ETF. So they announced their own ETF off of those futures, which is, I'm sure just uh, made everyone at SIBO and CME so happy. And, uh, and so they, they announced it's not live yet. It has to be approved by the SEC. But they did announce this ETF. And so we asked you guys, hey, you know, so are you guys, maybe you're interested in the, in the Bitcoin futures, but the word futures is holding you back. You prefer an ETF. Now maybe you got one. What, what are your thoughts? Are you interested in this new Bitcoin ETF announced just yesterday by our friends over there at ICE? Simple, simple questions there. Yes, no. This is getting crazy, or I prefer the futures. Uh, let's start with you, Mr. Rock Lobster. First off, where are you falling on the great uh, when we will see Bitcoin options debate? And then secondly, what do you think people are people are responding positively, negatively to this uh, proposed Bitcoin ETF by ICE? Or what are your thoughts there, sir? Uh-oh, he did it. He's speechless. He did it. He, he <laughs> One more time in 2017, he has forgotten to unmute himself. Mr. Rock Lobster, I mean, are you there? I was, I was six months without hitting my, without <laughs> self-muting. Six months. <laughs> what a maroon. All right. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm saying second quarter uh, is when I expect it, although I know they all want it in the first quarter as fast as possible. Um and then as far as the ETF go, you know, I think the ETF brings it closer to, you know, and I think the futures, you can list options on those. I, I, you know, people seem to like ETFs. Wow. You can take your, you can take your 401k money and buy it, I guess. Um, so uh, I think I find that, um, I think people are going to like the ETF idea though, because it makes them feel warmer and fuzzier somehow. Certainly is a bit of a uh, bit of a maybe a welcome thing for people who don't like playing in the futures, Mr. Uncle Mike. So you said Q1 or no? Did you say Q2, Andrew, for the options? That you said. I'm thinking Q2, except I think the you know the guys that run the SIBO would like it Q1 January. Yeah, they, they would like it tomorrow <laughs> if they had if they had their chance, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uncle Mike. Same question for you. Where are you feeling? Have you changed your view on uh, all things uh, when we when we might see the Bitcoin options, and then also. What do you think our audience is feeling on this proposed Bitcoin ETF? Are they into it? Are they more a fan of the futures? Are they not into it? Or are they thinking this whole thing is getting crazy? 
I think that I'm going to stick with Q1. I think I'm optimistic on it. I think they're going to pull out all the stops to make this happen somehow, some way. So maybe I'm a little bit over optimistic on it, but I am predicting that uh, by the end of Q1, we will be talking about Bitcoin options on this show. Uh, in terms of the ETF coming out, I think that uh, a lot of our audience is going to like it. Uh, just because of the fact that uh, a, a lot of people do tend to feel more comfortable with ETFs than they do with uh, futures. Personally, uh, I don't think if, if I were to delve that much in the Bitcoin underlying world, I would probably feel more comfortable with the futures. Uh, but in reality, I really wouldn't feel that comfortable with the futures to begin with. Uh, not saying that they're uh, priced incorrectly or anything like that. I just think it's just too volatile for my taste. Uh, what I do think is going to happen or what I hope happens is uh, I've heard a, an advanced technical term from a veteran option trader on this show before about certain volatility ETFs. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, predictably crappy. So the fact that I'm looking to do some type of a short with options on Bitcoin uh, when I'm able to do so, uh, if the ETF is predictably crappy because of the role that exists, uh, that exi uh, if, if there's the same type of a role risk that uh, a lot of the other ETFs do that have futures in them, and it makes them predictably crappy, then uh, that's just that much better. So uh, that's uh, kind of where I'm coming from on this. Well, where our audience is coming from is they're feeling what you're selling here, Uncle Mike. 45% uh, saying Q1, so they're in the optimistic category. I guess if we can get those futures cleared and, and, and you know, and approved in a span of a couple of weeks, it seemed like, then uh, maybe we can get the options that fast. I'm, I'm more at the Rock Lobster and the 26% of our audience who say Q2. I think that's a more reasonable time frame. But still, 73, uh, per, actually 71% or so saying it will be sometime between, and by Q2, we will see those uh, those options. So everyone's leaning first half of the year. I got to go there. Only 10% only Q3, 19% saying Q4. So no love for Q3. And a lot of love, a lot of interest in this uh in this Bitcoin ETF uh, thing. You guys are all over the place on this. Uh, it looks like it just expired. It was a very brief uh, poll we did on this one. Still got a lot of people pouring into it. Um, and uh, we gave you four choices. Yes, no. Uh, are you interested? Yes, no. I prefer the futures or this is getting crazy. 37% saying yes. So uh, interesting. And then a tie for second place between no and this is getting crazy, which I, I could certainly uh, I can certainly empathize with the latter there. It is getting a little nuts when we see products that have barely been listed for a week suddenly have an ETFs proposed on them. <laughs> Just uh, it is a little bit of a rapid product uh, development and launch cycle, shall we say, listeners? Only three percent saying I prefer the futures. So, at least according to our audience, ninety seven percent. Not wanting anything to do uh, with the futures or uh, or these things. So uh, interesting stuff. But they like the ETF. So maybe the ETF will be where the action is. All right, really quickly. Oh, let's check back in. Uh, we'll do that. And we'll do that in around the block. Let's instead see if we can get a um, some uh, quick ones here. Uh, what do we got? What do we got? Um, options. we exercising. Weirdest thing we've seen in the options market from Chad. That'll take a long time to answer that. Uh, this, I like this comment from Tom. Uh, let's be honest. If any of us had any, had any size Bitcoin, we would have sold it out ages ago and probably be kicking ourselves right now. I think that's true. I think we. I, I can't imagine anyone here on this show would have held it to uh, the ripe levels of twenty thousand, and then you'd be upset. You dumped it at ten thousand, right, Mister Rock Lobster? That's how that works. Exactly. Although I, it's funny. A lot of my old uh old kind of colleagues old trading buddies from the pse they have managed to hold on to it for a lot longer than you would think <laughs> so um i i had to say some guys have made some pretty big no pun intended some big coin in bitcoin i wanted to use that you've been you've been waiting <laughs> all show for uh for that one you're getting punny in your old age up there mr rock lobster andy chen wants to know well so will vic stay under 10 in the next three or seven years? <laughs> I just love that question because, A, it's so random, even though we were talking VIX at the beginning of the show. B, the time frame is just fantastic. Uh, three or seven years. He doesn't want to know four, five, or six. He's not interested in that. Three or seven is his precise uh, time frame. I guess this alludes to what we were talking about earlier, the number of days VIX has been under 10. Uh, but, yeah, 
I'm going to go out on a limb and say, yes, VIX is going to be under 10 for the next seven years. What do you say to that, Mr. Rock Lobster? Imagine, can you imagine that market, <laughs> what that would be like? <laughs> I think there are just, the streets would be red. <laughs> well, um, We'd all be mowing I, lawns. I guess. <laughs> and probably thankful to do it. Uh, although our 401ks would probably be doing really well. So, um, as far as that goes, I I think, again, it's just a prediction, but this is probably, it's hard to get another year of this sort of low vol um, because that means just everybody has to do everything right, and it's just hard to believe that can happen. Um, so I'm, I'm going to say no. You're going to see higher vol than, you're going to see higher than 10 vol over the next three to seven years. Mr. Uncle Mike, last word here, sir. VIX under 10 for the next three or seven years, yay or nay, sir? I will say nay, but I don't really, I think it's going to go higher, but uh, we were all wrong when we had this conversation a year ago. So what the heck do we know about VIX? What the heck do we know indeed or why he chose that weird time frame? We shall never know. Instead, we'll keep on rolling right on into our final segment. It's time for Around the Block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. Uh, checking back in really quickly here on our old friend Nike. This does appear to be one of the more tepid. Uh, if you sold that $3.5 roughly straddle, you're, you're a happy camper right now. This thing hasn't budged pretty much since we talked about it. So either these quotes are garbage <laughs> or uh, it has only moved about 13 cents in the after hours, in which case... Uh, you may indeed be a happy camper on the open tomorrow if you're on the premium selling. If you were loading up, sp hoping for a home run out there in Nike land, then perhaps uh, perhaps that is bad news for you and indeed your portfolio. But we are coming up against it here, uh, heading out into probably the quieter end of a week. And of course, Monday is a holiday, so there will be no trading. So all the usual caveats apply. Watch out. For all sorts of fun decay lurking in there. Probably going to start seeing that coming out uh, pretty soon if we haven't that already. Let's start with you, though, Mr. Uncle Mike. What are you watching for the rest of this in week and into the next truncated holiday week, sir? Well, I don't think there's going to be a ton going on from the major market standpoint, but we might get a little bit of a Santa Claus rally going into the end of the year. Uh, the other thing that just kind of just catching my eye right now, I'm just looking at Bitcoin futures. Uh, it appears that we have, and this is just my quick caveman math on this it looks like we've had a 17 percent drop peak to trough since uh like 7 30 in the morning yesterday so i'm just gonna watch bitcoin just out of fascination of the whole thing um once again i have no position on it at this stage of life but uh uh it looks like uh it's it gets kind of volatile during the day i'm gonna continue to watch that it's fun there you go. Nothing makes you feel better when you have the flu, like watching massive volatility in, in Bitcoin. There you go. It's exciting. It soothes. It's like chicken soup for the soul, but uh, nothing, nowhere near as nutritious. <laughs> Mr. Rock Lobster, take us home, sir. What are you watching for the rest of this, tr this week? And then, of course, next truncated holiday week. Um, what am I watching uh, besides, well, Bitcoin? I don't even know if there's anything to watch on that, but... Um, if we can see that low VIX, um, if it if it can close below nine tomorrow, uh, could be. Uh, it seems like they've taken it out a little bit, um, and you know, twenty seven hundred, twenty seven hundred by the first of the year, because it's just that nice big round number. Other than that, I think you're just going to put this year in the books as a you know a record equity closing. That's what we got. That's what we got for this show as well, listeners. But as Uncle Mike alluded to, we're not done for the year. No, you're not done with us quite yet. You got to put up with, us, up, up with us, easy for me to say, one more time here in 2017. That'll be next Thursday. Uh, so we will be off on Monday for the option block. We will be here tomorrow for our usual show, so you get your nice dose of volatility viewing in the morning and then a little bit of twifo in the afternoon so if you can't get enough of uh, the commodities or you can't get enough volatility we got you covered tomorrow then we're off for monday and then we'll be back uh with to wrap up the year with a bow on thursday and friday of next week but before we go as always let's start off see what my cohorts my partners in crime have cooking 
Mr. Uncle Mac, we'll start with you because you're probably on death's door. What uh, what do you what do you got cooking for us, sir? Oh, death's door can't keep me down. I'm too excited for the upcoming year. If you're looking at your commission statements over the course of 2017, as I recommend everybody should do, and you're just so insanely uh, ticked off of paying those enormous ticket charges, give me a call. I might be able to help you in 2018 with a lower ticket charge for your commission, 312-212-3531, or shoot me an email at mtosaw at rcmfs.com. There you go, listeners. Hit him up. Take advantage of him now while he's a little loopy. Maybe get even get even better deals than you usually do. All right, and last but not least, speaking of deals, what deals you got in store for us, sir, over there at the option pit, Mr. Rock Lobster, at, at the year end here? I was just thinking of a loopy two saw. It's kind of funny. Uh, look for announcement for us. There's all kinds of year end deals on our education products. Look for our new Vault newsletter coming out uh, after the first of the year. Um, if, so if you want to learn how to trade Vault, it'll be the, probably the cheapest, easiest, and hopefully most profitable way you can do that. Also some uh, and some other announcements from uh, our Carmen line, our hedge fund, um, our hedge fund subsidiary. So we got stuff coming and. That's what we got. There you go. He's got stuff coming, and that's what he's got. Check it out over there at optionpit.com. On behalf of the Rock Lobster and Uncle Mike, I'm sure they all want to wish you a uh, happy, happy holiday season, whatever you guys that celebrate out there. I won't have to do it right now because I'll be back tomorrow with some Vol Views and some Twifo, so stay tuned for that. And if you're not going to join us for those, for whatever reason, then we'll see you back next Thursday for more of the Option Block. Seeding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 